Um, I'll share some uh, notes from the previous course because I found them uh, very nice and I think they would be um, useful to, to look at them. It will be useful to, to, to go through, through it again. Okay, so where is it? Uh, last week we just had uh, a bit of introduction about the, the, the topic and uh, the book, what is it, how it's made and everything. So the um, chapter software for modeling uh, basically is uh, an introduction uh, still about uh, modeling and uh, it says about um, uh, how, uh, what is a model, what are the different types of models. Uh, it shows some uh, examples and then uh, even highlights some difficulties that uh, may arise when making a model. Um, but uh, more uh, on top of all the, all all this thing is there are um, a couple of interesting resources, which uh, basically are the, the foundation of this uh, of this book, and that would be very nice to to have a look at in case you are interested in uh, I don't know going more deeply uh, on the topic. So go back to the the beginning of thing. Um, we we have um, uh, we we are going to use tidy models. Uh, th this is the package uh, the, uh, that we are going to use. Uh, every, everyone knows. This is a meta package. So we are going to learn about a bit more about this uh, meta package. Then uh, um, we talk about uh, what the first uh, classification of models, such as descriptive, uh, inferential, and predictive. Uh, what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised? And then uh, again, uh, a, a, a family, a further family subdivision uh, between regression and classification, and then differentiate. Between quantitative and qualitative data, we want to understand the role of data uh, within the our model analysis, which is very important. And uh, then we we just talk a bit about what is what we are going uh, through reading this this um, this this book. So tidy models make a meta package. Um, Let's um, think about, about models as uh, mathematical tools. And uh, we, um, uh, we use these tools to describe a system. Uh, and uh, the, the final ob objective is to capture the relationship within data. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so the, um, we, we make models for uh, several different purposes, in particular for predicting future events, for determining differences between groups, uh, hiding map-based visualization, uh, still not a map uh, in, in, in geographical terms, but map of data and then for discovering novel patterns to investigate, maybe a little further if we have doubts or if we want to understand some, something that is not um, evident. So tidy models meta package, uh, I've mm, taken this, this picture from uh, Min, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, <laughs> Santika Rundel. Maybe and then be yes, sir. This is a nice, very, very nice. I've put it on Slack presentation. Uh, it makes a comparison between the use of tidy models and the baseline uh, model. And um, so, in this this picture, um, let you see uh, the different uh, packages that are uh, belonging to um, tidy models. 
and so there is um, you you don't need obviously uh, just a bit of introduction when you install tidy models. Uh, uh, these models will be installed installed as a dependencies, so you don't don't need to install them separately. So you don't need to install each each of them, each one of them, but they will come with tidy models. So this is why it is a, still a meta package. So um, uh, within these packages, uh, I like to mention uh, receipts, uh, and this is the. Um, um, package that we used for, for making the formula uh, for modeling. So it's a tidy interface for data pre-processing. So this is the pre-processing part. And it, it lets you use some step functions uh, for making receipts. Then we use Parsnip and this Parsnip is um, um, a package which tidy, unified uh, interface for fitting models. Here there is a PASNIP syntax for making model, which is the main difference with model-based packages. Uh, so the, the, the model-based way to, to make a model. So it's a little bit more articulated verbose, but just because you uh, can make adjustments with, within your parameters, um, uh, otherwise, exactly the same as base model. And then there is resample for data splitting and resampling. Workflow, workflows package lets you allow you for some functions where you can uh, uh, assemble receipts and uh, parsing parsnip syntaxes um, and put everything inside a workflow to have a unified um, function that you can then adjust with maybe some resample things, some tuning parameters. Um, and then, so then we have uh, Yardix, uh, Brooms, Infer. Uh, so we, we will go, we will touch them, but we don't go inside each of this, each one of these packages because we, we may use some functions from them. I have a quick question. So I've tried to use tidy models a bit and I've always kind of like felt it somewhat black boxy and I don't know if it's just because I'm bad at reading instructions or what, um, but so from my understanding, is it like the workflow package is like this and then everything else is inside it is kind of the logic of it? Is that right? That, that, that's, that's correct. It's it's okay. like a box a box where you um, uh, put inside your receipt, which is the formula, and the pre-processing part. So you adjust your data with the step function, and then you also add uh, obviously the engine with the, the model, and everything will be linked inside a function which is workflow function, which is a workflow function. And you find, uh, then you, you add the, these things for practice to have uh, a unified things. When you uh, have fixed a model, you decide for a model that would be useful for, um, for having everything uh, just as a unified function. So the, the first uh, models classification uh, there are um, three are the most important categories uh, in which model falls. Uh, the first one is descriptive models, and these are the, 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 um, the starting point to have an idea of the trend of our data and the identification to ad identification of the differences within data and assumptions are obtained with the application of theoretical assumption. Uh, and the analysis of model residuals. Let's say an example of a descri descriptive model is um, uh, a smooth function that you use, uh, for example, with the geom smooth. And this way you can, um, for example, here I've used the, the MS data and is one of the data sets um, that 
we will find in the book and we will go through and analyze this, this data. Uh, it's inside model data uh, package. And uh, the, the first step for modeling is um, uh, choosing the uh, predictors and then uh, do a scatter plot. Uh, this is the first step for you to un have a, a visualization of what is the trend of the data. If they are somehow linear or not. So then uh, with a ggplot and um, a geom point, you uh, may want to add a geom smooth uh, and then see if it does in, in some and in any ways represent your the, the trend of your data. After this, this is let's say that uh, is the, the first step that for you to understand uh, what you can do with your data, how to spend your data. Another, the following step will be making inferentials uh, on your on your model, and um, so to make make hypothesis test, specify hypothesis that are tested with probabilistic assumptions, like, such as statistically significant and produce some type of probabilistic output. And this, um, an example of this would be the p-values, the confidence intervals, I don't know, the standard error, all those things that you extrapolate from, from your model to make inference and, and draw conclusion about your, let's say, first draft of your model. Then the, the, the third step will be making a predictive model. Um, as um, a predictive model is to produce predictions and the structure of the prediction is made to forecast trend for new data. Uh, one example of this will be estimation, measures of uncertainties, error forecasting, and uh, evaluation of prediction methods. Within the predictive models, we have a further subdivision, which is uh, we, have we, we can have mechanistic models or empirically driven models. And these two uh, differences we, we will see better within the, the, the next chapters when we apply um, uh, differential equations to derive a specific model equation, we, we will see that uh, uh, a model has uh, uh, like uh, a main uh, uh, trend or resolution and uh, uh, resolution is not correct. So uh, when we make a, a prediction that we compare this prediction with our observer data, observed data, we can see if this, uh, if our prediction is uh, uh, basically the, the, um, uh, the, the, the things that, the, that we wanted. So we, we can achieve this with um, standard models, let's say like this, or empirically driven. Uh, an example of empirically driven, just to make a counter example of uh, mechanistic models is the k nearest neighbor in um, in this case we compare we make something a bit a little bit more complicated than just make uh, making a, a linear model uh, because uh, in in this particular case uh, we we use we are searching for the the mean of a certain number of uh, K, uh, and so this is, uh, let's say, we, are, we will go through this uh, within the next chapters, but um, there's a differentiation between uh, sim um, very simple models and more complex ones. And uh, this differentiation will, will be able to uh, assess the, the choice of your model, on your data in a way that you uh, can finally achieve your objective. Uh, 
So to conclude this this um, this thing, uh, as I said, we have three type of models: descriptive, inferential, and predictive. But uh, in general, uh, we can have uh, three different type of things. This is uh, um, is depends by the type of analysis you are carrying on, on your data. Otherwise, uh, uh, you might follow the three steps. So you do a descriptive model, then you do inference, and then make a prediction. In general, a linear regression model uh, generally fall into all of these classes of models. Okay, so... Um, we, uh, I don't know, I've mentioned it about this thing uh, last week, uh, but very quickly, uh, we will use unsupervised and supervised models. Unsupervised are the models with not an outcome. So we examine uh, just the matrix of data and we want to see if they in what way they belong to each other, if they divided in, within groups and how these groups um, are subdiv subdivided. And then supervised models are classical models when we have an outcome and we want to see uh, and predict an outcome against some uh, predictors. Um, the main dif differentiation within the supervised models are regression and classification, because if you have uh, numbers, so you have an outcome that you want to predict, and this outcome, it's numeric or quantitative, so you are going to make a regression model. If you have uh, uh, ordered or unordered qualitative values or character, so not numeric, you are going to make a classification model. So this is not a regression. You may have a logistic regression when you have uh, um, uh, an outcome which is uh, like uh, uh, um, look like a character like false and wrong up and down but then you transform it in dummy variables in zero and one so you can use it within a logistic regression model okay so we have already talked about the differentiation within these two uh, type of data so we have quantitative data with numbers qualitative data with characters, so not numbers. And then uh, the ingredients of our model are the outcomes and the predictors. So inside the formula, we are going to put an outcome when we are doing a supervised analysis. Uh, an outcome, which is the, the one that we want to predict. So we want to say if the, I don't know, the blood pressure for female um, within uh, uh, 30 and 45 years old is increasing under some condition or decreasing under some condition or what is the... Um, no, that, that's not correct, increasing or decreasing. If you want to see what is, what would be the, the, the pressure uh, is to women, um, uh, so we, the, this would be an outcome. So I'm going to make a model and uh, extrapolate the prediction uh, to see um, a most probable value of blood pressure. Uh, Mm, and this would be uh, applied, um, so solve it basically, uh, with some the use of some predictors, which are, I, I don't know, like the, the age, uh, what some, some, I don't know, like portion of food that they eat or the number of uh, exercises they take. So the, all, all the elements that will uh, will be able to influence the, the results that you are uh, aiming to achieve. 
Okay, so what we are going to do is to clean the data within this chapter. We we use uh, um, some some data which are different. So we are going to assess the data and uh, clean the data, investigate the data to make sure that they are applicable to project goals, accurate and appropriate. Then we need to understand this data. And this means uh, uh, the best way to understand the data is make uh, a visualization, is to make a visualization. So with exploratory data analysis is the first step. So we assess the data uh, and then uh, uh, explore to understand um, our outcome and our predictors, how they relate to each other the main trend and then decide how to proceed. And then um, we develop uh, expectations and see, for example, I, uh, what, what this model is, is doing and then communicate the result. Okay, so this is a picture that I really like it um because uh it, it really lets you understand what's happening when you make a model so you do exploratory data analysis initial feature engineering and this this is the the uh, the bit where you assess this the specification for the, for for the model and then the model starts so the model is like a machine uh, with an engine and start moving, arranging your data and following your instruction or the instruction provided by the type of model that you have chosen. Then you evaluate the model uh, and then decide if you want to do more feature engineering, that means you, I don't know, maybe tune parameters, add more parameters, do a resampling things, which the can be different from the one that you have already done it. And then so rerun the model, see the result, and then maybe you want to compare more than one model. So you fi uh, finally uh, do model evaluation, checking some metrics, and then tell the world what you found, the results that you found. So this is, um, um all the things that are in the uh the, this first chapter and um as i said uh, for example this this was uh, um one of the examples that i personally didn't really understand very well I don't know if any of you has a, a better explanation for this, but um, this is an example that says that um, taken for uh, give um, an idea for what descriptive models are. And um, so this is the, the picture. Uh, which evaluate the quality of two microarray chips using a model. So, what they uh, what what they are saying is that the the red pattern um, put evidence that uh, of of discrepancies within uh, uh, this model compared to the other one. So. Here is a good quality, here is a poor quality, but I'm not sure about it. So if any of you. My, I don't know if anybody else is a biologist. As a more but I about, uh, yeah. I was gonna say, I don't know if anybody else is a biologist, but I understand this one. <laughs> yeah, totally. You would yes, never please. see, you would never see a, a very clear pattern of any kind on a microarray chip um, like that ever um, and a microarray is just it tells you what what expression level of all the genes in a organism at a given time point 
under a given treatment is. Um, and not, it's not every, every single one, but it's, it's an approximation of it. So this is tens of thousands of genes being expressed. And the, the genes are just organized numerically across the, the thing, and you would never see a pattern um, like this um, ever. I've never seen one. So, yeah, totally. This is like uh, this. This would be like called out in publication for uh, fraud. So, when, when they're saying like we're using a model to determine whether or not our microarray work, array works, are they saying the model we're using is our previous knowledge that we should see no spatial effect, or is it the model they're saying where whereby we have blue and red color showing up? The, the blue and red is just expression level um, above and below a certain threshold, I believe. I'm not exactly sure what that threshold is. So yeah, yeah, I, I got that. It's more like when they say using a model to understand. Oh, oh sorry, my connection is really bad. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Same is cutting out for me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm just curious with the model they're referring to here, are they saying the model that would give us blue and red? e.g. a model that we expect an average expression and then above that average expression is red or blue, or is the model they mean here our mental model that we should expect no spatial pattern in error? I guess, I guess it doesn't matter, they're both models, but this is what, just what I was wondering. So it is, uh, the images show two different colors. The red is where the signal intensity was larger, so the signal intensity was larger than the model expects, while the blue color shows lower than expected values. So, but, um, as I said. <laughs> so I guess what, what I'm saying is we have two mental here, right? We have model one where I expect the average expression of a gene is 3000. Um, that, that's model one. And then model two as a mental model is that I expect no spatial correlation in my errors. So I guess the model they're referring to here is the model that I assume the average expression of a gene is 3000. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and rather than just be a spatial thing, I want it, the models maybe more simple than that. Just the fact that you have more that are red than expected mm -mm. or they're since they're so bright red too, they may stand out even more. Mm -mm. Could just be a distribution thing, you know, comparing distributions. Mm -mm. So basically- we, we have to read the yeah. paper. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So basically, uh, uh, so it's not, uh, uh, so the challenge is to find the model that will be uh, able to represent your data appropriately so you, that way you can make a proper prediction. And this is not uh, a, an easy task sometimes. Um, okay, so... Uh, so that, the yeah. other thing I was a bit confused about is the idea of a mechanistic model. So right. this part where they're talking about a mechanistic model, are they saying we can use like linear models to actually get like true relationships between variables? Or like to say, if I add, I don't know, if I, I think a good classic one is how you can model weight and age. Um, so if you have, weight and age like this uh, in a person from birth to death. See yeah. that at all? Yeah. You could model that with like, you know, weird quadratics or, or cubics or something like this, right? But you wouldn't say that truly the relationship between weight and age is, is cubic or quadratic. So I was a little bit confused about this idea of a mechanistic model. So I was one. I have a question, Al. Um, I mean, I was kind of wondering if there's like certain, um, basically, like the drug example they give, where it's like 
based on repeated experiments, and I'm also I'm not a scientist, I'm an economics background, so I'm way out of my lane here, but like there are certain assumptions that have, about how like you can predict that something will happen, but there is a certain amount of random variation that will still be there. For example, like it's not just gonna be like solving for X, like an algebra, we're like, well, the, this is your weight, so this is an amount of drug, exactly how the drug will be in this sort of metabolized. Can that can I say something? Uh, sorry, Laura, but uh, at least for me, your sound is a bit like uh, not not very good. Got reverb or something. Uh, yeah, some reverb, some me metallic things. And so I don't know if you can, because we we didn't really understand. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I can go get. I'm gonna try and go get a headset or something. So. But I, I, I got what your point is. Basically, like you could say, okay, if we're doing a, something like drug, we could model that we say, I don't know, what is their particular thing? Drug metabolism. Maybe let's take weight again, right? Like you could say, okay, I can predict that someone will have X amount of drug left in their system um, using an equation that's like, I don't know, Y equals like weight cubed by gender. Um, as, a, as a quick example of an equation you could make up. But I don't know if like you could say that like the true mechanism between that is like a cubic one, if that makes sense. Like this, I was just a little worried about this like mechanistic verbiage. So can you all hear me now? <laughs> okay, great. Can you hear, I feel like I'm on one of those like 2005 cell phone commercials. Okay. Um, anyways, yeah, so what I was saying is hopefully this will come through this time is that there are certain like like al was saying um equations that predict close like we know because of scientific and you know discovery how a drug is you know administered in a different way than like an economist such as myself would theorize about the relationship which is much more vague the empirically driven models between like crime and poverty and you know those kinds of things and but there still is it's not just an, an amount of random variation that will be inherent even in a mechanistic model because all those little individual differences that even a lot of research can't take into account i mean theoretically i guess if you had infinite variables you could but there's a limit to what we know scientifically so that's kind of how i thought about it brandon i know you said you have a biology background so or anyone else who does feel free to jump in and um <laughs> correct my non-scientist uh approach laura to to add to your to your comment wouldn't wouldn't am, sorry i'm gonna mess up that word mechanic mechanistic uh approach it would be like you developing your utopia of of human society versus <laughs> the real world example of what we actually uh, uh predict you know the future will look like does that so like it's it's the it's the wish list of what if we if we deploy this perfect world this is what a human would act like versus this is an actual human and this is what we're going to to look like in the future um i'm reversing the the comment uh because it it, it does al you're you're asking a very important question in that in that mechanistic concept and i i just quickly googled and it said you've got a a, a the uh, airplane and you want to uh, build a new airplane based on you know the principles of flight um you know change your wing profile change your fuselage profile blah 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 and then is this going to be optimal is it going to work versus we have an airplane right now and and based on the turbulence that we're seeing blah 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 you know what we can change to to modify it and optimize it it's it's like the real world example versus the future of what a, a, a new model would be. And I could be completely confusing that comment too. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. So just to add on that, I, I continued making drawings because this is who I am. Uh, so <laughs> let's say we've got this beautiful little thing again about metabolism and I put into the model like weight and gender as my two predictor things. So we can force a model into doing this, but of course, if we also added these other variables like the time of the day and how much I ate recently, we could also then force our equation to fit those models. 
So I guess our mechanistic model depends on what we input, which I guess is we're going to get to when we get to feature selection. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and uh, I would say that, uh, uh, for example, a, here make, makes a, the example, a counterexample with an empirical driven model using the key nearest neighborhood. So I, I don't know, uh, these are uh, the mechanistic models are classical models like linear models. And the empirical driven models are, for example, care ne nearest neighbor, where you can um, assess, for example, the number of key uh, and change them as long as you carry on with the with the modeling and see that if you want to, um, if if the model uh, will be better suited with more. Um, number of key than less, and um, th there is uh, some some statements that we have seen uh, within the uh, another book club, uh, the uh, introduction to statistical learning, and uh, the, that was uh, said something like there is a difference between models that are more a little bit more complicated against models that are, are uh, simple, but uh, they may uh, not very well suitable for, um, uh, you know, representing your data. So this, this may be recalled something uh, in here as well, such as the mechanistic model is just, uh, you know, like when you do a scatter plot with a geom's mood and you say, uh, I represent my data, uh, roughly this way, uh, and it's like uh, that I set some assumptions that, uh, that they are functions uh, where um, your predictors act for making the outcome, while empirical driven models uh, are those models that are slightly more complicated, but more uh, more they they will be able to represent your data better but uh, are difficult to explain to the clients so you say i've made this prediction this is very good i've used a very complicated model or maybe not very common one with some adjustments and everything so this is the result the result is good but i'm not um i have difficulties in explaining what, what is happening inside to release this result. So, because there is a continuous adjustment while the, the mechanistic model is you fix it, the equations, because the equation is what is happening inside the, the, the linear model function. For example, inside the linear model function, there is a, there is a set of equations or one equation at least, and then you, you set them and they, they will be like that. You use them and that's it. You, are make, you have made a model and that's your model. Yeah, I really like- no, should Yeah. Oh, sorry. I really like the, the example of the bookstore because, well, first of all, I thought about my local bookstore and it kind of made sense because like, for example, five nearest neighbor, right? Why would that theoretically be better than four or three? It's just because maybe the five is more accurate. Um, there's no like theory that would underlie like, oh, you need to compare it to like the five most similar books or whatever else. So um, I think kind of the gray area for me still is when I think about the social sciences, and again, I'm coming from my own perspective here, uh, we definitely don't have like differential equations <laughs> that we would like, like in the drug example. But there usually is some theory behind, you know, variables that are included in the model. It's not just like a bookstore example where the five <laughs> nearest neighbors, right? So right. it's like trying to kind of, does that kind of straddle both depending on what, now you could use a K nearest neighbors predicting some sort of social, I have to really think about an example, but theoretically some social science phenomena. But um 
you know, I don't know. It's like sort of mechanistic, but not really because <laughs> we definitely don't like, it's like, oh, theoretically crime and poverty, or for example, or, you know, um, inflation and other, you know, what's supposed to do. But then you always have like, things that break the rules and all these, like, you know, the Phillips curve was a big deal for a lot of time. And then it's like, oh shoot, like seventies happened and people are like, you know, maybe not. <laughs> so. Yeah. You, you're right. Now I haven't said that correctly because uh, well, I mean, a model, for example, that's, that's, it doesn't have a defense equation. So it's not, the, but uh, I'm, because I was thinking, for example, the, the SIR model, for example, and um, if you uh, want to, the, the one for infectious diseases, no? And when you make this uh, SEER model, you do um, uh, differential equations. And uh, these differential equations are, uh, for example, when you uh, set the, um, the, the distances between, I don't know, uh, the, the number of cases, on the time uh, uh, si since the start, I don't know. You set the time when you want to to decide this, and uh, then you add the number of uh, um, infected, and then the recovered. That would be so. You you set this this um, this like uh, um, uh, this series of of differential equation for making your model. And then the model will act by itself, repeating these things. Uh, this is the, the, the thing I was, uh, I was thinking when I, um, I, I said the difference equation. Because if uh, in, in actually when, when we use the formula, we don't see them, yeah. I was I was just going to add that when we think about these models in in plant sciences where I am, the empirically driven models are considered hypothesis generators. So you don't know it doesn't tell you why that came out of your model as important. You have to figure that out, and then once you figure it out, you can then put that variable into your mechanistic model, and that describes your world better than the previous version of that model. Um, I put it in the chat there. Yeah. That even, even I, I, I drew that models, picture. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh, okay, here's my K nearest neighbors. Look, I clustered them. And now I have groups that I put that into my model. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I put that in the chat too, because it's like, you know, even, even imperfect mechanistic models are still mechanistic. Like you're still describing a, a thing. And then you just improve them by adding things that come out of maybe empirical models, or you 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 see them in the field. In my case, with plants, um, that sort of thing. That that's how I think about it. So I guess then in that case, a lot of the social sciences models would be considered mechanistic, even though they're certainly not as clean as a lot of the you know hard sciences models, because we do as like you know you you do you can't derive equations the question is how good the equations are but like theoretically they should hold up lots of noise um yeah i mean i guess like linear regression obviously would be a classic example of a mechanistic model um because you're estimating parameters based on their definition here so okay that's this is interesting yeah, I suppose in social sciences, what I've read, which is minimal, and apologies if I misrepresent your field, um, it's really hard to pick out the variables that matter the most. And so you end up with models that are reasonable at scale, but- um, Terrible prediction. <laughs> ter terrible prediction at local, yeah. Again, apologies if I misrepresented. No, no. Economics. Well, I actually work in supply chain now. I did work in economics for a brief time, but you know, going back to my um, econometrics and days, and I mean, I still do some. I do pseudo modeling in supply chain, but it's not, and it still is very challenging to do sometimes. But forecasting demand, so it's kind of a similar, you know, forecasting just sucks in general. It's an interesting field, but it sucks because it's like very hard to get a handle on sometimes. So. 
I had a couple questions about the model process. Um, so the first question I had is like, is that the model process true for all types of models, restrictive um, uh, and predictive, et cetera? Or, and my second question was, I saw like, there's kind of a final model at the end of the process. Like, is that the case? Are models ever revisited? When are they revisited? Um, that's that's kind of uh, the questions I had. Yeah, this this uh, figure. I guess it depends what your use case of the final model is, right? And like, so for example, are you getting more data? Maybe maybe you want to keep it online. Like this is something people talk about, right? Like having online models that are constantly updating themselves. Um, although I guess, for example, if you were putting the final model out in a paper and that was published, then we would call that the final model. It doesn't get touched again, but I guess depends. That's a boring answer. I mean, the way I see it in my world, yeah, you, you're, even if it's published, you're never really satisfied with it. There's always some other thing that maybe you missed or, or perhaps a, dif a different environment that you didn't observe in the first model that would add something. Um, so you're, you're always revisiting models um, that you that you make, and and in the case of like machine learning models, we we do some things where we add uh, up to date yield data to the model constantly, so it's receiving and retraining on the new data as it comes in, and that's a self kind of a self learning model. I don't, I, I'm not doing that myself, so I don't really know too much about it, but but I know that we're doing that. Well, I, I do know there's a lot of discussion about version control of both your data and also your modeling. So even, even by retesting it or re-evaluating re it, finding out if it's still a be best fit or you know, what adjustments need to be made, there's also version control in that as well. As to, so to answer your question, yes, you're, you're always going to go back and, and feed more information or, or fine tune exactly what it is you're doing to, to uh, optimize your 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 output uh, or to clarify. Thank you. I, yeah, I, it, it's useful to think about like the use cases, like um, and whether like the there is value in coming back to it. And uh, I guess like in my head, I was kind of thinking of machine learning models. I'm like, oh, I thought like it kind of never ends, right? But um, but yeah, it, thank you. Does this does this book talk about the idea of an ensemble models at all? I can't remember if this is in this book. Because this is like another example. Uh, I don't see it. I so don't see. Yeah. So I think I, so. I mean, yeah. It does? I think at the end, maybe. Be, yeah, because this would be maybe like something that would be also used, like what you would use a final model for is that you end up using rather than just like model one, three, four, or two, you use all of them and they all get to come together into one mega model that you use for your prediction. So that could be another thing you do with a final model. Yeah, to the end of the book, you, you find um, um, some, some chapters, more than one, uh, dealing with comparing different models and then finally choosing the, the best one. Yep, I yeah. see it in chapter 20, ensemble models. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. If uh, uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. What? Well, I missed it. Did we all introduce ourselves? <laughs> not not Can really. We do that at so, the end? Yeah. Sort of, sort of last time. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we did. I, yeah. I've been really busy this week and the last two weeks, but hi, I'm Anna Lee. You can call me Al, not Al. It's okay. Hello. Um, hi. I'm a PhD student. Um, I'm American from the accent, but I live in London. And I'm also a biologist. Um, I, I study RNA splicing and stuff, but people, not plants. Okay, so I'll go next. I'm the plant biologist of the group. I have studied uh, vegetables for vegetable and vegetable production for about 15 years. Um, I'm, I work near New York City, 
uh, actually just across the thing in New Jersey um, at a vertical farming operation. Hi, I, I can do it. Um, my name is Isabella. I uh, actually work at our studio in the marketing team, but was trained in uh, data science and previously was a data analyst in K-12 education. Uh, really interested in learning about modeling. Um, my previous role was more focused on the data collection, wrangling, cleaning, reporting uh, side of the data science spectrum. And so really excited uh, to learn more together with you. Nice. Yeah, go now. Uh, or do you want to go, Laura? Oh, you go. It's fine. Okay. Um, I'm Esmeralda. I'm based in Reading, UK. I'm starting my PhD, um, aiming to try to predict how the vegetation in the past responded to past climate changes. And yeah, I think that's why this um, course will be useful. Yeah, that's me. I'm Laura, I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. Um, I work, I have a master's in economics, so that allows me to call myself an economist, even though I do not work in the field anymore. I've kind of got a little dissolution with economics. Um, don't tell my old professor that because she just invited me to speak at a symposium by the Fed. <laughs> so I'm going to try to convince young women to go into economics just like I did. Um, but yeah, so I work for in like demand forecasting at a big pharma. Well, we're not really that big, but we're moderately big uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, we make a lot of opiates and uh, other things. So that is trying to forecast our customers who don't forecast very well themselves. Their demand is always fun. And yeah, I'm hoping to maybe imply, uh, apply some more machine learning frameworks um, to, we just do like forecasting, like the basic, you know, models, time series models that a lot of people do. But I've, I've heard good things about tidy models and wanted to kind of see if there's more we can do to improve our forecasting, so. Federica, do you want to go or I can I can jump in? Yeah, yeah, I'll go next. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I, uh, I go first. <laughs> okay, well, my name is Federica Gazzelloni and uh, I'm Italian. <laughs> I don't know if you have <laughs> finally understood the accent. So I live uh, in Italy and uh, in Rome, exactly. I've spent some year uh, in London, about five years. I'm a statistician, uh, then a naturally. Then I have got a master uh, in um, administration, finance and control. And then I've started working uh, as a collaborator with the IGME. So since the start of this pandemic, because of uh, collecting data about COVID and everything. So I really like it. And then uh, got trapped with it with in Excel, so I needed a more uh, robust uh, tool to use. I've started learning R, so it's not very long. Couple, I don't know, when did it start? It? So a couple of years now. So I enjoy doing visualizations, data visualization and modeling is I'm strong with theory. So I want to put the thing a bit more in practice. Let's say this somehow strong. I don't know. I've done lots of math theory and everything, like 10 years of those things. And uh, I enjoyed this community. So I thank God to, to have stumped in, in it because um, it's really nice. So thanks for attending this book club. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll finish up. My, uh, my name's Ryan. I, I, uh, I work in the rail industry. Uh, my current title is called Technical Training Manager. Um, I oversee a lot of uh, training orchestration delivery to the rail industry in general. Um, there is an application called Positive Train Control that I've been involved with for about the last 10 years. Um, I, I do have a grad degree uh, with a focus in business analytics. Uh, with that statement, I would probably say I'm the most junior out of the data science world. Uh, I'm trying to aspire to be that person. Um, very heavy into open source tools, Linux, et cetera. 
Um, if you have any Linux related questions, please feel free to ask them. I probably have an answer quickly. Um, with relation to our studio and, and all the uh, uh, various packages and tools, uh, uh, mapping, et cetera, we used it heavily in, in a lot of our coursework um, for the uh, grad degree, uh, but I've never actually deployed it in real world. Um, within our business, our organization, uh, I've been asked to do a lot of understanding of the data generated by a locomotive and then how to, uh, I don't know, best optimize what it is we're doing. Um, we have a lot of analysts, but nobody that's really data science focused. Um, so with that in mind, I'm hoping to try and fill that gap or at least help guide users into that world. Um, I deal with a lot of people that are not mathematically inclined. Uh, and so discussing, talking, applying, you know, certain uh, traits, modeling traits or, or analytic traits, um, you kind of get that uh, cross-eyed, uh, uh, dazed and confused look. So it's, uh, it's good to have that training background to bridge the gap between them. I come up with a lot of um, analogies. Uh, I, I'm really good at, at uh, talking or bridging almost any subject with any other subject uh, as a comparison. So if that ever helps or, or if anybody needs to come up with a different idea of how to vocalize what you're conveying, I'll be more than happy to jump in there too. So uh, this is uh, Frederica. Uh, this is our, our uh, I don't know, fifth book club, sixth book club. Um, so with relation to our R4DS learning community, um, there's a lot going on there. Uh, I think I joined in it's either January or February of this year. So it's been an on, ongoing, extremely wealthy, extremely uh, uh, great community to learn from. And uh, I, I would only say, don't ever worry about uh, appearing naive or, or making any sort of questions like that. It's perfectly acceptable. And everybody is extremely supportive of, of those type of uh, details. So it's great to see everybody. Thank you. What sort of data does a train make? Uh, it's, it's mass, mass IoT information. So lots of geospatial data, um, your water pressure, oil pressure, uh, air pressure, um, all of our serial data, discrete data um, uh, related to communications, data exchange, we got networking traffic. It's, it's, it's mind boggling to wrap your brain around how the rail industry operates. Um, Laura, you mentioned supply chain management. So um, rail falls really close into that in a transportation media. Um, the amount of information that is generated, a lot of users will just look at a train and you know the crossing arms come down, you're stuck, you're, wait, you know, you're late for work. Uh, you're trying to, to get through the crossing and they, um, there's so much information uh, vocally and, and, and through computer IoT. Uh, exchange, edge computing type exchange that happens uh, just to get the crossing to close and, and protect the right of way. So signaling, yeah, it, it's, it's insane how much uh, information's out there. Are we gonna have good passenger rail in the US anytime, uh, ever? Uh, yeah, I, uh, Amtrak, so Amtrak is a federally funded organization um, if you're talking of, of the entire US in general. Um, because it's federally funded, it implies that they're always under budget cut and always running at the least amount. Good way of comparison uh, or comparison from Amtrak would be our postal service and all of the uh, uh, issues that are going on there. With uh, relation to communities, uh, uh, you know, heavy rails or, or even uh, uh, light rail uh, type services, subways and that kind of nuance. Um, when I make a comment about heavy rail, I'm talking like the uh, metras and the, uh, you know, Caltrains and, and, and sound transits of the world, um, light rail. I, our business doesn't get too involved in the light rail side of things. Um, uh, CTA in Chicago would be an example of a light rail, um, Chicago transit, whereas Metra is their more heavy commuter rail, bringing staff from outer areas into the, the city. So, so no, Great you question, have no though. hope for a good passenger rail. I, I, I have to be a pragmatic. I, I just have to say that, that even locomotive uh. mechanics is, is so, um, it's just a massive beast of a machine. It's slobbering all over the place. It, it has just raw power. 
and uh, yeah, you're, you've got a 10,000 ton uh, uh, vehicle traveling at 60 miles an hour, and, and the expectation is it's going to stop immediately, and nobody takes into account the physics of that kinetic energy and how long it takes to actually stop. Um, yeah, crossings are actually one of the most difficult points of, of protection. Um, it's it's where the it's where the Jane Doe John Doe interfaces with the rail industry the most, and um, it's the hardest to protect because by the time you have a, a potential visual problem, you're never going to be able to stop in time. So that's actually one of the the uh, good stuff. Good stuff. We got good stuff. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. So thank you very much. We reached the top of the hour. Thank you very much. We see, uh, I don't know, uh, if any problems, anything, just uh, advise us uh, on, on Slack. Uh, hope you all attend next week because Brandon is going to uh, lead us uh, on the next chapter. So I'm, have a I'm good going. Yeah. I'm going early because the modeling stuff is my weak point. So uh, <laughs> okay. hopefully it's a refresher for most everyone here. I think the tidyverse stuff uh, from what yeah. I am perceiving, most people are familiar with it. So I'll, I'll try not to be too dry. Excellent. Thanks. So. Okay. Have a good uh, weekend. See you next week. Bye.